Hi, I'm Lee Teschler, Executive Editor of Design World Magazine. And I'm Michelle DeFrangia, Assistant Editor of Design World Magazine. Today we are looking at an oscilloscope called the SDS-2000X series from Siglent Technologies located near Cleveland, Ohio. So Lee, there are lots and lots of oscilloscopes out there. What's interesting about this one? Well, this particular model is what's called a super phosphoroscope. And the basic idea of a digital phosphoroscope is that it contains some kind of parallel processor that lets it capture and store waveforms that might be happening faster than the electronics running the display can respond. The phosphoroscope label comes from the idea that these digital scopes behave in a way that's analogous to how the old analog phosphor storage scopes used to work. Well, that must have happened just after the end of the Civil War. Well, it was a long time ago, but not quite that long. <laughs> Once upon a time, I actually used phosphor storage scopes, and the point of them was that points on the scope display would be more intense the more often the waveform traced through them. The way these phosphor scopes reproduce that behavior is by manipulating their displays. Each point on the waveform is stored in some kind of memory in the usual way, but the scope displays intensified waveform areas in proportion to the frequency of occurrence of the signal at each point. This has the same appearance as those displayed on old analog phosphor scopes and gives rise to the name. So how do you use that when you're trying to display a waveform? Well, one of the interesting things about this particular scope is it can display up to 256 different intensity levels to show things like proportional frequency of occurrence. It also can produce a color temperature display so that the points on the waveform with the highest frequency of occurrence are red and less frequently traveled points on the waveform display in proportionally cooler colors. Now before we take the covers off the scope, are there any other features we should mention? Well, like most scopes today, there are a lot of aspects to how this thing operates, and we could probably spend an hour uh, just going over its various triggering modes. But before we get into its internals, we'll just mention a couple of points. The SDS 2000 X series uses 140 million points for each single trigger sample. It has a waveform capture rate of up to 140,000 waveforms per second normally and 500,000 in what's called a sequence mode. That's where the waveform doesn't display until sampling is completely over and the data memory is completely full, all done as a way of capturing any small probability of events. And there is a history function where you can record and play back a waveform occupying up to 80,000 frames. Well, Lee, I think we're ready to go ahead and take a look. The scope disassembles from the back. The back cover is held on by Torx screws, and beneath the back cover is a metal shield that covers the scope internals and holds the switching power supply and a cooling fan. Now our analysis today focuses on the scope operation, so we didn't analyze the power supply circuit at all. The metal shield is held on by Torx screws and two nuts that screw into the BNC sockets. So once you unscrew those and unplug the fan and the power supply, the shield comes right off to reveal the scope circuit board. One of the first things you see on the board is five heat sink chips. That's a problem in analyzing what's going on here, right? Well, yeah. You can't get at the chip markings without removing the heat sinks. And the heat sinks aren't really designed to come off. So we'd have to risk destroying them to figure out what they are. And that's not something we want to do here. But we can make some guesses about what goes on based on the traces we see on the PCB and on what some of the other chips are. Now I also see a big metal shield below the chips with the heat sinks. You're right. Uh, that metal shield is over the, the uh, four input connectors on the front of the scope. And there are eight holes in the shield, you might notice, that gives access to trimming capacitors. They let you tune the scope input network so it looks like a 50 ohm load to the incoming signals you're trying to display. And you have to shield the inputs this way because they can be pretty low-level signals, and you don't want them to get garbled by some of the other signals floating around on the board before they get sampled and displayed. I would think the sampling circuits would be near the inputs for the same reason. Well, I agree with you, and I suspect the A to D converters are, in fact, among the heat sink chips that uh, we can't identify without destroying the scope. They all lie pretty close to the shielded input section, and it would make sense that they'd require heat sinking because the scope uh, with a 300 megahertz bandwidth like this one um, would use A to D converters that could really be cranking along. So here are the clues. Uh, 
there are four 2 gigabit memory chips straddling two of the heatsink chips. There are a lot of PCB traces running from the heatsink chips to the four memory chips next to them. That's what you might expect when you've got an A to D converter feeding four digitized signals to the scope's channel memory. So my guess is those are the scope's main converters. But there are two other smaller heat sink chips sitting beneath those two on the board. If the bigger chips are A to D converters, what are the smaller ones? Well, that's a good question. I'm not really sure, but those chips have connections to the bigger heat sink chips above them, but not a lot of connections. Of course, we can't see all the traces because this is a multi-layer board with lots and lots of through-hole vias. But from what we can see, there aren't like um, 16 or 32 connections between the small heat sink chips and the larger ones directly above them. And that's what you expect to see if the smaller chips were feeding digitized signals to the bigger ones. Also, though I didn't precisely count the number of pins on the two smaller uh, heat sink chips, each of them have about 130 pins. These factors in mind, we can speculate on what the two smaller chips are doing. And the fact that their heat sinks mean they have to be cranking along much of the time. If they aren't D-to-A converters, my best guess is they might have something to do with the scope's built-in function generator. Well, that might explain what four of the five heat sink chips do. What about the last one up in the corner of the circuit? Yeah, that one. Um, that one seems to be more straightforward. It sits up near the main connector that goes from the board to the scope display. And a lot of its pins connect straight into that connector. So our guess is that's a display driver. Now there's a separate Netzol static RAM chip on one side of it and what seems to be a Samsung DRAM chip on the other. They probably comprise display memory and my guess would be that one is for the waveform information while the other one takes care of the readouts on the display such as the frequency of the displayed waveform and similar patterns. Now there are still some big chips on the board that we haven't talked about yet. That's correct. Um, the display driver chip also has connections to the biggest remaining chip we haven't discussed yet, which is an analog device's Blackfin processor that runs a scope. It sits over here next to a Micron 128 megabit synchronous dynamic RAM chip and a 128 megabit flash memory chip from Spansion. When you tell the scope to memorize the settings for a particular test setup, the information gets stored in that flash memory. The Blackfin has a RISC instruction set that's known for fast execution times, and it runs up to about 600 megahertz and only dissipates about 2 watts at most. So it's often used as an embedded processor in appliances and instruments like this one. That leaves one other large chip down here, uh, which is a big logic block device from Lattice Semiconductor. That one's an FPGA kind of a chip, so we don't really know what goes on in it but it sits between the Blackfin processor and the uh, A to D section of the board and above seven chips, which are all the same kind of high-speed comparator. So if I was to speculate about what it does, my best guess might be that the lattice chip and the comparators might help define the functions synthesized by the function generator in this scope, which actually has an output over in this corner of the board. Comparators like these are often found in sample and hold circuits, which might come in handy when you're digitizing waveforms. But again, we're just speculating here. Finally, there are a lot of other chips on this board as you get to the left-hand side away from the main scope functions. These generally handle housekeeping type chores like level shifting for the various logic technologies that are on the board, Ethernet connections, and other stuff that you need for running the instrument. So overall, how would you sum up the Siglent scope? Well, back in the dark ages, I actually built an oscilloscope from Heathkit, which had an astounding 5 megahertz bandwidth. So I'm continually astounded at how instrument makers have been able to design equipment with bandwidths in the range of hundreds of megahertz like this one and put them through a high quality assembly process, which obviously this one has gone through, and offer them at an economical price. Certainly the Siglent scope is in that category. Well, Lee, thanks for helping us scope out the internals of this instrument. And if you'd like to see more Teardown videos like this one, check out our video library at designworldonline.com and eeworldonline.com. Thanks for watching.